Praise God. Well, it's good to have you here today. We're going to be in the, the book of 1 John, as I mentioned. And so the past couple of weeks, we, were, we kind of looked at the events of the, um, uh, surrounding the death and the resurrection of Christ, so Palm Sunday and Easter. We looked at those things. And we were in uh, the Gospel of John last week. And I kind of want to keep on, on that theme of believe. And um, So 1 John is written, the same author as the Gospel of John, right? So he writes the Gospel of John, he writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then he writes the book of Revelation. So he is known as the disciple that Jesus loved, okay? And he'll, he's referred to that in his own Gospel, all right? He doesn't use his own name. What, what we do know about 1 John, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. I, whenever I read a book, I kind of want to know what that book is about, okay? And so what we do know is that the apostles remained in Jerusalem for a time after the resurrection of Christ, but then soon persecution will break out. So if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. It scatters the church. It's kind of like, uh-oh, right? Bad thing, right? The church is done for, right? Is that what happened? No. Yeah, I mean, there was some persecution. Nobody likes persecution, but it, what it did is it got the believers outside of Jerusalem to so know the gospel is going to Samaria, to other parts of the world. It ends up, it even ends up in Rome and things like that. Paul goes on missionary journeys to what is modern-day Turkey now. So it's referred to Asia. So we were watching a show last night. It's called, you know, there's a book in your Bible, two books in your Bible called Thess- Thessalonians. So Thessalonica is what it's referred to in biblical times, but it's Thessaloniki now, right? That's what they referred to it as. So we were watching this thing. It's on Greece. And, um, but th- those are all parts that Paul traveled through, and he started churches in Corinth and in Athens and Ephesus. So John ends up in Ephesus probably due to persecution, and that's where he writes this book, First John, from. Is, is there, and it's probably to the believers that are there. So in my electronic version of... Uh, 1 John, it has this preface, and I really like what it has to say. It says, John, 1 John, um, is filled with simple words, okay? Love, life, light. Those are simple words, right? But he fills them with deep meaning, and in this letter, he elegantly, elegantly explains basic truths about the Christian life. And so that's what he does. So that's what we're going to look at. So let's bow our heads in prayer, and we're going to dive in together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you that it is the living word of God that speaks to us today, Lord. Um, That is our prayer, that it is more than just words on a page, that it is, that it speaks life to us, instructs us, guides us, helps us to know you better. That's what John is talking about. He wants people to walk in that relationship that he had with Jesus. And so, Lord God, we give you the thanks, we give you the praise, we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin with verses 1 through 4, just kind of as an introduction, and go from there. All right. In the beginning, that Greek word is RK. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Think of all the words that begin with RK. All right. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and I'm in the wrong book. I am. Where was I at? I was in John. Not First John. There we go. All right. But, <laughs> just look at the screen, huh? All right. It's kind of like, hey, he does refer to this, but all right. First John 1, that which was from the beginning. See, they sound a lot alike, don't they? You notice how he begins the same? Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked at, and our hands have touched. So he's really talking about, hey, Jesus, we walked with him. We saw his death. We saw his resurrection. We saw all that. This we pro- proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, we testify to it, we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. There's that word fellowship, all right? And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son and with Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Now there's a little bit of how they translate it as your joy complete, our joy complete. So let's look at this. He says from the beginning, that word archae. So think of all the words archaic, right? From the beginning or archaeology, right? Can you think of any others that begin with that archae? Um, it, it refers to from the beginning. So who, what is he talking about from the beginning? Well, from the beginning for John is probably referring back to when he met Jesus. He was a fisherman, right? 
doing his thing, fishing him and his brother James. They were fishermen. Peter and Andrew were also fishermen. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene, begins his public ministry, and Jesus says to them, come and follow me. And they say, well, let me go home and let me think about it. Is that what they said? It said that they dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. They followed him. So for John, that's probably where it all begins, from the beginning where, where Jesus makes himself known to them and they begin to follow him. So that's around 30 A.D., okay? And now John is writing this book of 1 John. It's about 90 A.D., so about 60 years have passed. John's getting probably, he has white hair like me. He has some white in his beard, probably a lot, right? And um, maybe a lot of the disciples are already have been martyred. John is one of the only um, apostles, disciples, that actually does not die due to persecution. They tried to kill him. They tried to poison him. According to uh, church tradition, it doesn't work. He ends up dying on an island in um, isolation where he writes the book of Revelation. All right? So he writes this from the beginning. So he's saying, I'm going to give you my account. And he goes, what, I've, what we've seen and heard. So John is saying, man, I've touched Jesus. I, I mean, I, I, I shook his hand. I've given him an embrace. I've looked in his eyes. I was there when he did the miracles. I saw him resurrected. I saw him when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He was there. And so there's some passion. There, there's some excitement in what John is telling us here because he wants, he believes in Christ. He believed in what he, he uh, experienced. and He wants others to believe as well. And he refers to Jesus as the word of life. Okay? In, in the Gospel of John, he calls him Logos, the living word of God. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He goes, that is what we proclaim to you and so that you can have fellowship. So that word is koinonia. It just means it's an act of sharing in activities and privileges in a closely connected group. Okay? So there's some fellowship, camaraderie that is present there. Um, that idea of koinonia. And then joy that your joy may be complete. And I believe he wants to experience, he's writing to them because he wants their joy to be complete, but that's also going to make his joy complete. You following me on that? He's going to be excited because other people are put in their faith, their belief in Christ, and that's going to make his day. So, that's kind of an introduction. I want us to jump into the first point. Um, we're not going to give it quite yet, but just look at verses 5 through 7. Um, yeah. All right. It says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So light and darkness. If we claim to have fellowship, there's that word again, with God, with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live in the truth. Okay? But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So John likes to use these metaphors, light and darkness, right? And he'll use, he was the one that refers to Jesus as the bread of life. And he has one other reference there too. He's the good shepherd and other things like that. So John uses these metaphors, but he, he uses these simple words and then he takes us, helps us understand what the meaning is behind those, all right? Um, and so, um, Going back to John's gospel, which I was going to start on earlier there by accident, it says in verses 1 through 5 in the New Living Translation, in the beginning was the Word. So there's that word logos, the living Word of God that already existed. The Word of God was with Him and the Word was God. He existed from the beginning and God created everything through Him and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never be extinguished. So there's that idea of light and darkness again. You know, light shining in darkness is a reference to God's revelation. Now, how many have tried walking in the dark and you stubbed your foot, right? Get up at night, the lights aren't on, and it's really bad when your spouse moved the furniture on you and you didn't realize it, right? All right? Or the kids leave something on the floor and you step on it, trip on it, right? It's kind of, oh, that wasn't supposed to be there, right? But in the darkness, we don't know where we're going, right? But when there's light, we can see clearly where we are to go. So Jesus was the living Word of God. He was the light of the world that came into our world to show us the way to God, to show us God, but also show us the way we can have fellowship with God. 
So there was the Old Testament and the Old Testament letters and things. So people had some revelation that was there, some light of how to serve God. But God saw it was necessary to send His Son to show us the way to be the light of the world so that we could know how to follow and walk with God. Is that making sense? He was that light. Now this scene, when, when Jesus came as the light of the world, it seems so contrary to the system that was built by the religious leaders, these Jewish leaders. Probably back, way back when they had good intentions, but by the time that Jesus comes, it's rules and regulations. And they've lost the idea that to know God is all about a relationship with Him. It's, for them, it was doing a checklist. I have to do this, 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 and this. And it had nothing to do about the heart. It had nothing to do about a relationship with God. Now, how would that work in your earthly relationships? Your spouse, your children, if it was just all about checklists and it wasn't about relationship. Relationship means you're spending time together. You're talking, you're communicating, you're doing things together. You're not doing it because it's a checklist, right? You do those things because of work maybe, right? <laughs> but you don't do those because of your family, your relationship with the people you love. That is what God wants with us. He doesn't want us to be in this system where we're doing rules and things like that and checking off boxes and just doing whatever we want to do outside of that. He wants it to be a relationship with us where we walk with Him. But in that, He sheds light. So there's, there's some responsibility because He's going to show us the light of where we're going to look, okay? Where we need to walk. So the first thing, if you're taking notes, is fellowship with God involves walking in His revelation to us. So that's light, okay? So John calls it light, but what he's talking about is revelation to us. So how do we walk in God's light, His revelation to us? There's several ways that we'll just highlight here real quickly. First of all, it means to be in God's Word. This is God's light to us. It's His revelation to us. It tells us how to live. It tells us what's right and wrong. And sometimes we don't know that. And sometimes people come to God and they start walking with God. And it's like, man, I never felt bad for doing those things before. Now I feel bad because I read about it. And now I know it's bad. And now I feel bad. And Right? You ever been there? I have. Right? So it is God's revelation to us. It shows us how we can walk in His light. But more importantly, how we can have fellowship with God, what pleases the heart of God. Psalms 119, written by David, verse 105, says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So you can imagine in, in biblical times, they did not have street lights, okay? And on their vehicles that they traveled in, you know, their donkey, I don't think they had a system where they could hook up some headlights to that donkey, all right? So a lot of times they didn't travel at night. Why? Because you could fall into a ditch, you could fall into a hole at night. And I, I've, I've had some bad experiences running through backyards <laughs> at night, all right? I've been, I think I've been clotheslined once and, you know, and uh, I'm still surviving. And there's been kids that have tried to walk through our, run through our backyard, and we have a garden back there that is fenced. So, you know, it's kind of like the hat's still there, <laughs> the fence is bent over. They probably had maybe too much to drink or something, I don't know. But they were running through our backyard. And surprise! All right. God's revelation to us. A second way is through prayer. So we pray and we ask God for revelation, he, he, He'll speak to us. It says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and He prayed to the Father. And, and so when Jesus clothed Himself in flesh, he, he did not cease to be God. He was God. Okay, But He did set aside His ability to be everywhere at once. He set aside His ability to do anything He wanted to do. He confined Himself to a human body, so that meant He had to give up a lot of His abilities to be God, but He still was God. All right, But if He was going to talk with God, it's not like He had this telecommunication thing going on with the Father. He still had to go to God in prayer and seek the Father. And it says that He did what He saw the Father doing. You know, how would that work for us that if we kind of checked in with God every morning and we kind of we're following His way in the morning instead of just getting out of bed, stumbling through our day and thinking, man, what just happened today? It's like we go from one fire to the next, right? I've had those days. Prayer. Prayer is an important part. And then the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it's kind of interesting. John refers to Him as the paraclete. And I don't throw out these Greek words to confuse anybody, but para, okay, if you're in the school system, a para is somebody that works alongside the teachers, right? 
So that's where we get that word, para, it's, it's Greek word. But the paraclete is just the one called along to be our helper, all right? Now, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. John calls him that in, in chapters 14 through 16 of his gospel. He spends four, three chapters on the Holy Spirit, and he calls him this paraclete, the helper, the one that would help us. But it's interesting, John also calls Jesus the original paraclete, the original helper that's going to be with us. They will help us guide us into all truth. So, I don't want to go down to me rabbit trails here, but walking, if we want to walk in fellowship with God, it involves walking in His revelation. So that's what John is getting at. He says, if we claim to have fellowship with God, but are still stumbling around in darkness, we can't have fellowship with Him. It's important that if we want to have fellowship with God, that we get into His Word, that we spend time in prayer, and know what He has to say so that we can have fellowship with Him. Amen? Is that making sense? Now, if, I, if we were to talk about this in earthly relationships, which I think God put those in place so that we can kind of see it in that light, if we want to have relationship with our spouse, with our children, there's certain things we need to do if we want to have fellowship with them. We can't just go through the weeks and the months and never talk with them, right? How does that work, right? You're not going to have a relationship with them, right? You're not going to get to know them. You have to spend time with them. Now, it's not a checklist. Maybe sometimes it is, but, you know, I had to take a walk with my wife, all right? No, you know, um, I need to play with the kids, right? I mean, we prioritize the things that are important to us, but that's how we maintain our relationships. The same is true with our relationship with God. Amen? All right, let's go on a little bit further, verses 8 through 10. So this is kind of the way I preach. If you've never heard me preach before, this is kind of usually the way I preach. So kind of walk through it together. Um, Verses 8 through the end of chapter 10, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You ever talk to some... Some people are very upfront. They know they're a sinner. They know they're not doing right. And other people say, man, I'm, I'm fine. If we confess our sins, this is the cool part, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that cool? But if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. What is sin? Um, Sin has a couple different words in, in the New Testament, but I think it is to basically ignore the revelation that God has given to us. Okay? So, I'm going to illustrate it by saying, um, No trespassing. You ever seen a no trespassing sign? All right. And we even have one out here back for our fire pit because um, it's not that we don't want people to use it, but we don't, you know, then there's liability issues and stuff like that. So if they start it, the fire happens, but it wasn't approved by us, then there's issues, right? All right. But there's times that we can, we see that sign there and we have that choice to either watch the sign, we can obey the sign, or we can ignore the sign, right? Um, No trespassing. That's what actually one of the words for sin is that we've trespassed against God's law or His Word. And so sometimes transgression is a matter of ignorance. So there's times that I've sinned just because of auto-omission. In fact, so I got just a couple minutes. So I'm going to tell a story on myself. So I like to hunt, and one day we were hunting up in North Dakota, and um, it was very hard. A lot of the property where we were at there was posted, so you can't hunt on it, okay? So we were finding it. Finally, we found a place. There was no hunting sign, and the geese were coming in, so we set up. And next thing we know it, a farmer comes up. I thought my life was done because I thought he was going to run us over. He was very upset. He was livid to be, you know. And he says, so oh, I, I had it posted. Well, I, you know... I did park by a no, <laughs> no trespassing sign. I did, really. Did not see it. But where we, where we had set up, there wasn't one there. So technically, he should have had a sign where we were at, technically. But I felt pretty bad. That really bothered me for a long time because, because I had done something out of ignorance. And there's times that we're going we're gonna to sin against God not because we willfully did it, because, man, we just messed up. We didn't know it was wrong, right? 
But there's times that we mess up, so we call that a sin of omission, but there's also sins of commission where I know that it's wrong and I, am g- I say, you know what, I'm going to just go do it anyway, right? It's like that chocolate cake sitting on the counter. I know I can't have my third piece today, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? We do it anyway. So that's sin of commission. I don't, you know, whatever the case may be, sin is sin. But the cool thing is that when we come to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Isn't that good? Now the Galatians, if you read the book of Galatians, they kind of thought, hey, you know what? God forgives us of our sin. We can go do whatever we want, right? And God's going to forgive it. And God's, Paul says, no, you can't do that. God's taking you out of that. You, can't, you need to do your best to walk in the light, right? That he has provided. He's going to bless you because of it. But if we do sin, God is there for us. But the second principle is that fellowship with God involves confessing our sin. Um, We have to admit, hey, I sinned. I made a mistake. I have to confess my sin. And if if we live our life saying, you know what, I haven't sinned. I don't need God. God really can't do anything for us. But when we say, you know what, God, I've messed up. Sometimes willfully, sometimes in ignorance. I've messed up. You know what? God's not going to beat you over the head. What He's going to do, He is just and faithful. He's going to forgive you of your sin. And He's going to help you to walk each day in a way that glorifies Him. And sometimes, um, we're, I'm not going to jump ahead. That gets into my next point. Confession is very important. There's a, a prayer that I, I don't know, it's probably been three, four years. It's called the Daily Examine. How many have heard of that? It's a 400-year-old kind of practice that was started by Ignatius of Loyola. And it's five R's, if you want to remember it in a way. One is you relish the moments that went well for the day. So it's at the end of the day, you're placing your head on the pillow. That's what I would do. So I had to do this for a class. And it, it's something that I, I don't do every day, but I do it a lot of days. So I put my head on the pillow, and I reflect on the day. And I think, what went well? What did not go well? All right? Reflect on the day. Thank God for the good things that went that day. Good that day. All right? Thank Him for that. Then secondly, request the Spirit to guide you and say, God, reveal to me what did I not do well today? I'm, because we, we can be a little bit blindsided, right? We, we can, uh, sometimes we don't always see our sin the way God sees it. And so He asked the Holy Spirit saying, God, reveal to me how did it go? What did I do well? What did I do? Review the day. And then number four is repent of mistakes or failures. You know what, if there's things saying, God, hey man, I messed up today. I had a bad thought. I got mad at somebody. I did that this week. I had to go and confess. I had to go make it right. I had to apologize. Um, And then the last one, resolve in concrete ways to live tomorrow better, to live it well. Think about, pray about tomorrow. I don't know, I found something like that was very helpful, just a practical tool of how, God, I can reflect on each day, I can grow each day and become uh, who God wants me to be and walk in fellowship with Him. But it also involves that idea of confession. I think confession is something, um, some, some Christian denominations or fellowships do a better job of that and weave confession into that. But confession is it's kind of like, oh, you know, some people are just like, oh, that's the end of the world to confess something. You know what? We're probably all going to sin each and every day. The goal is that we sin less and less every day. Okay? I don't know if every, every one of us will be sinless before we meet God, but we should be in that process that that sin becomes less part of our day and walking with God and fellowship with Him becomes more of it. See, the thing is about fellowship, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day, right? Genesis, right? Man, just think, God walking with you in the garden, right? What destroyed that perfect picture? Sin, right? See, that's the thing about sin. Sin, it, it, you can't have it between you and God. So God sent His Son to deal with sin in our life so that it could be forgiven. All right? Number three, verses one and two of chapter two. It says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, so there's that idea that we should sin less and less. But if anyone does sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And so that word advocate is paraclete. It's the same word that John will use for the Holy Spirit. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is our advocate, right? He is the one that is there to counsel us, to help us, and to speak in our defense. And so the terminology is there as if you are on trial. So imagine you're on trial. And I, you know, I hope none of you have ever been on trial before, but maybe you have. So we won't go there, all right? <laughs> but if you've been on trial, you're really going to relate to this. But imagine you're on trial. And the accuser is who? Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's referred to that in Scripture. And what he's going to do is he's going to bring up all your dirty laundry before God the Father and say, man, this is what he's done. They've done this, 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 and this. They're going to bring up, he's going to bring up all your dirty laundry. And you're going to be there as kind of like, yep, that's pretty much right. But then our defense stands up, and his name is Jesus. And he's saying, yep, all those things are true. They did do that, but I went to the cross and I took their sin upon myself. And because of that, their debt is paid in full. There's nothing against him. That's what Jesus did for us. He is our advocate. He represents us before the Father. The third principle there is that fellowship within, with God involves accepting his redemptive work on the cross accepting his redemptive work on the cross. So John says, you know what, I, I write this so I, I hope that you don't sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, and he will forgive you if you come to him, right? And his work, his atoning work on the cross will forgive, cover over all your sins. If you jump ahead to chapter 3 of 1 John, what, what I've learned, it's sometimes easier to forgive other people than to forgive yourself. You ever been there? Yeah. You can forgive other people. Sometimes that's hard too because sometimes people can really do some hurtful things to us. So I don't want to gloss over that because sometimes, yeah. But sometimes we have an easier time of forgiving other people than we do ourselves. This is what John says in chapter 3, 19 through 20. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we have set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. What is he saying there? He's saying, you know what, God knows when there's condemnation there. And Paul will talk extensively about that in Romans, that when we're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But in order for us to have fellowship with God, we have to accept his work on the cross and be at peace with him. Why? Because you can't sit around a table and have fellowship with somebody that does not feel worthy that they are to be in your presence. Right? It doesn't work. They don't feel worthy. In order to have fellowship, you have to feel like, hey man, they're my friend. They're, I can have fellowship with them. I can be near to them. That's where you have true fellowship. And that's what God desires for us to have, but we can't have that if we're thinking in the back of mind, I know God has forgiven me, but I still feel like a dirty, rotten sinner. If that's how we feel, we're, that doesn't want us, to, that doesn't create within us the desire to draw closer to God. It creates a desire in us to be distant from God. That's condemnation. And as long as we have that feeling within our heart, God, God is there, but we're still going to feel distant from God. And God wants us to draw close to Him. That's why He dealt with sin. That's why He sent His Son to die on the cross so that sin could be removed. We could have fellowship with Him. He doesn't want us to feel like I'm not worthy to come before Him because I know of all my mistakes. If you've sinned, confess your sin to God. Okay, don't, don't gloss over it. Be honest about it and say, man, I messed up. All right? I've had bad thoughts. I've said bad words. I've done bad actions. Just be honest with God. Confess it and let God deal with that and forgive it and then draw close to Him. Are we good? Um, you know, some of this may be, this is just kind of basic Christianity, but if we don't get these principles down, what I've learned is that people that have walked with God for many, many years 
And if they don't get this stuff down, they, it still handicaps them in their walk with God because they're still dealing with feelings that I'm not worthy, that God doesn't love me, um, that I'll never be good enough. But God calls us to fellowship with him, and that's what John is passionate about. I'm going to have the musicians come. So um, we're going to partake of communion. And we, so some of you, this is like your second time here, so that, that's cool. Um, that's really cool. But um, so different churches do communion differently, all right? So uh, the way we do it is we have the emblems here, and we'll bring them to you. And usually we do it, we have the grape juice and we have the bread, and, uh, but we're kind of doing these COVID-friendly things for right now. And uh, once COVID is in the rearview mirror, we'll kind of go back to the real bread and the, and the grape juice. Uh, but they're going to distribute them to you, all right? And we're just going to reflect. The, the purpose of communion is to help us to remember what Christ did for us in the cross of Calvary, all right? And so in here is a, there's a cup, and it has the wafer on top and the grape juice here. It symbolizes the bread and the grape juice. So on the night that Jesus would be betrayed, part of the Passion Week, it's Thursday night. Friday, he's over Thursday night into Friday morning. He's tried. He's crucified on Friday. He's resurrected on Sunday. But that Thursday night, he has Passover with his disciples, which is a perfect picture because the Passover lamb would be who? It'd be Jesus, right? Jesus would be the Passover lamb. So... All the way back in the Old Testament, God is setting the scene. He's setting the backdrop so that they can be able to understand, hey, this is what Jesus, he's your Passover lamb. He's the one, it's his blood that's going to allow the death angel to pass over. So he would partake of Passover with his disciples, and they would be around a table. It wouldn't be like this table. It was actually lowered to the ground. And it says they would recline at the table, so they weren't actually sitting at a chair. They sat on the ground, and they would kind of kick out a little bit their legs, and, and they reclined at the table, all right? And as they were there that night, they were probably talking about the day, right? What do you talk about at your dinner table, right? Talking about the day, maybe making some jokes, and having fellowship together. And as that time is kind of winding down, that's when he takes the bread, and he breaks it, and says, take some of it, each of you. This is going to resemble my body that was broken, that will be crushed for you. And they're kind of like, what's he talking about? Because his death hadn't happened yet. And then he does the same with the wine, with the grape juice. He partakes of that and says, this is going to be my blood that's going to represent my atoning sacrifice. And he says, you know what, let's enjoy this moment because I'm not going to be able to partake of this moment again until eternity. So he refers to eternity. And so when we partake of communion, it does represent the fellowship. Fellowship with God, but also fellowship with each other. So the cross has the vertical beam, it has the horizontal beam. It represents fellowship with God, and it represents fellowship with each other. So as we partake of communion, it's reflecting upon what John is even talking about here. Our fellowship with God, but it's, there's a joy that comes as we fellowship with one another, the body of Christ. Because we have one thing in common here today. The Christ has redeemed us. He saved us. You may have different ho hobbies, different likes and dislikes, and all that type of thing. But you have one thing in common. If you know Jesus Christ, that we, he's covered over all of our sin. Amen? Amen? I'm going to have those that are going to help out with communion if they would come. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer of salvation. Um, that's just part of what we do here because I never know when somebody has come to that place where they've placed their faith in Christ. And um, so in that, we're going to just invite Christ into our heart. But we're also going to do that confession thing we talked about, right? And then, um, then we'll partake together. Father, the... Let's just pray together. I'm going to invite everybody to pray together. Saying, Dear God, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for my sin. Forgive me and help me to walk in relationship and fellowship with you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. They're going to distribute the emblems. When everybody has them, we'll partake together and, 
And, uh, but worship the Lord. They're going to le- do a course called Lead Me to the Cross. And uh, if you would, you can, I'm going to let you sit. It's just a little more comfortable that way. But would you just worship the Lord as they uh, distribute those today? Isaiah writes of Christ many years before it would ever happen. But it says that in chapter 53, verse 3, it says that he was despised, he was rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. And surely he took our pain, and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by him. In other words, that he deserved what he got. But the truth is that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace with God, fellowship with God. And by his wounds, we are healed. All of us are like sheep that have gone astray. Each has turned his own way. But the Lord has laid upon himself the iniquity of us all. Amen. So there's two layers to these. The clear layer on top reveals the wafer there that you can get. So I'm going to let everybody peel that off. You can hold that up when you're ready. So I know you're ready. Amen. 
Amen. All right. Father, this morning, we just thank you for the bread. We thank you for the grape juice that symbolizes your body and your blood that was poured out for us, Lord, that was the sacrifice for our sin. You took our sin upon yourself. You, you were perfect. You were sinless. You were the Lamb of God. You didn't deserve to die on the cross, but you went there willingly so that we could have fellowship with you and you with us. And so, Lord God, we give you the thanks, the praise we ask in your name. Amen. This symbolizes his body that was broken and crushed for you. Let's partake of it together. Amen. Then if you can peel off that other layer, it's a little more trickier, so... The same way he gave them the wine, the grape juice, and they partook together. Let's partake together this morning. Amen. Praise God. If you're sitting at the row seating there, there are communion cup holders in front of you on the other seats. There's just a little kind of a hook there. You can put it there, and they'll pick those up later. If you're at a table, you can just put it there. So, Amen. You know, I, I don't know how much you've thought about it. You can be thankful that God sent His Son to die on the cross. But I hope you don't catch the fact that God desires fellowship with you so much that He was willing to send His Son to die on the cross. That's pretty powerful, folks. God loves you that much that He was willing to do that for His Son. And I have three sons. And I can't fathom loving anybody that much that I'd be willing to sacrifice one of my sons. God loves you that much. Amen? Amen. We're going to close with an upbeat course. We've been kind of solemn and sacred right now. But um, would you stand? And um, we sang this course, I believe, earlier, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can, it's a good clamping one. But it talks about now I see. It talks about that light, the revelation. And, and uh, there's some, just some really good lyrics to this song. So um, if it's new for you, just do your best to, to sing it out and uh, get it into your heart and soul. Amen.
Theo, can you bring up that slide that says, I delight in his eyes, that part. So we were looking at John, and I like this. My heart burst to life, and I saw the delight in his eyes when he looked at me. I don't know what your vision of God is, God the Father. But maybe close your eyes just for a moment and imagine that you're looking at God the Father and you see delight in His eyes. You see favor, you see delight, because that's what John saw. He saw in Christ a friend. He saw in somebody that he could laugh with, he could fellowship with, he could live life together with. He saw the delight in the light, eyes of Jesus. And that's why he wrote down what he saw, what he experienced. And he proclaimed to each and every one of us still today so that we could believe, so that we could have fellowship with God, so that our joy could be complete and that we could have joy with God the Father. Amen? Amen. Hey, good to have you at Radiant Springs Church today. If you see a new face... Introduce yourself and uh, uh, encourage you to do that. Um, about 10 minutes, whatever. We're going to, if you're doing the pizza with the pastors, we'll kind of just, I think, take these tables on this side here and uh, we'll get rolling with that. So, um, but fellowship with one another, get to know a few people, and God bless you this morning. Greet each other as you leave. God bless. <laughs>